Good morning, everybody. And I want to welcome Jim Carson, our guest speaker here. And I just wanted to tell everybody a little bit um, um, how, why he's here, how we met. Uh, so back in 2002, uh, he, a friend of his, Rich Holloway, who was a distance study student here, I believe, gave uh, Jim and, and, and Kimberly, but she's not here, by the way, I should say that. She was supposed to be here, but she got ill the last minute, so she couldn't make it. But they'll, they'll both be back in January, so you get to meet her then. Some of you know Kimberly uh, already. But anyway, uh, <clears throat> Rich gave them my book, Naked to the Gate. They read it, and they were impressed, I guess. <laughs> anyway, they sent me a letter asking if they could come on retreat at Cloud Mountain in those days. And they gave some background and stuff, and they seemed like serious practitioners. And I said, OK. So they came on retreat that fall. And they were serious practitioners, a great <laughs> retreat. And uh, we really valued having them there. And then for a few years, they kept coming back on retreats. They lived in North Carolina at the time, so they couldn't attend you know, Sundays and all that. Uh, but then uh, several things happened. First of all, Kimberly got pregnant with twins. This was in what, 2005? Mm -hmm. So then- Or born in 22, but yeah. So what yeah, I guess the whole year, <laughs> right. So they're 20 now? They're, they're, they're all, no, they're turning 18 uh, on the 11th. So yeah, oh, so wow. it, was, it was sometime, I guess in February, but- that 18, happened, yeah, okay. of, of, uh, of that year, yeah. So anyway, they so then they couldn't come for a while. And in the meantime, uh, they lost their jobs and they were looking for some other place to settle. And they thought, let's come to Eugene. Let's go to Eugene. And it turned out they couldn't get any work in Eugene. And they ended up uh, first in Salem and then in Portland at the, uh, what is it? The uh, Oregon, Oregon Health and Science University. Oregon Health and Science University. And you both worked there, right? Yeah. yeah. So uh, that's where they settled. That's where they're raising their kids and all that. And you've been there ever since. And every once in a while, they do come down here. And then let's see, before the pandemic, Kimberly came down and taught a yoga for seniors, I think it was, a class for a, a, a whole Saturday kind of deal. And uh, so that, and then she used to teach a lot of yoga when we would be on retreat. She'd lead a lot of the yoga sessions. She's a professional yoga teacher, I guess you'd call her, right? Among other things. Yes, yeah. among other things. Anyway, so that's, the, that's how we know them. And they're sort of, uh, you know, even though they don't live in Eugene, they go way back and they're old friends, and uh, uh, and we're really looking forward to hearing what they have to say about their work. And so I'm going to turn it over to you, and uh, you can go from there. Okay. Thank you so much, Joel. And uh, it is really uh, an honor and um, privilege and pleasure to, to be here. We have, uh, Kimberly and I have received so much from uh, our relationship with Joel and the other teachers in, in, in this setting of the CSS. So we are grateful for the opportunity to, to give back to this, uh, this community that has been so enriching for us. Um, so yes, I just want to say, Kimberly really wanted to be here. She's, uh, you know, uh, right now I'm, she's listening to us and she's with us uh, virtually. But she really wanted to be here in person, but it was not meant to be. And so uh, she will be here for the, the next uh, talk that we will be giving together. Uh, she did help me prepare the material that I'm presenting today. So she's here in the form of, uh, of the, the material. And this is the first of two talks that we're going to give on the topic of Kashmir Shaivism. Uh, so <clears throat> this is a, a vast and deep topic, and there's no way that we can uh, really give it, uh, do it justice in just one presentation. So a lot uh, of the important um, aspects of this tradition we won't even touch on today, but we will uh, in the next time that we, we present. So we'll, there will be some slides uh, that will go along with the presentation. So I uh, met my guru, Swami Muktananda, in 1975. And about a year after meeting him, uh, he, he was returning to India. And he said, well, get a job. Come to India after you've saved your money. 
And through a series of amazing events, I ended up getting a really nice job uh, driving in New York City, where I had never driven before, but um, I was hired by a very wealthy um, person there uh, who had me as his personal driver. You know, you could call me a chauffeur, but he wanted me to dress in just normal clothes and look like any, any person. But um, I was pretty much available for him all day long, uh, you know, five days a week. And that gave me a lot of time uh, hanging out because, you know, a lot of times he would just go somewhere and say, you know, just I had a, um, uh, what do you call it? A, um, that, pager. A what? Pager. Yeah, pager. So, you know, <laughs> there would be hours where I was just waiting for a pager to come. And at that time, I was deeply immersed in reading uh, the commentary of my guru on sutras from this tradition. I'm going to say a lot more about what the Kashmir Shaivism tradition is, but I want to kind of introduce it with, with this story. Um, so I was reading his commentaries on various sutras from this tradition, and they were very rich. Um, and one that I was really contemplating deeply a lot was, uh, it states, na shivam vijate kwachit. Nothing that is not Shiva. Nothing that is not divine consciousness exists anywhere. <clears throat> so I was really you know, feeling into this and thinking about this and uh, you know, playing with this, uh, this sutra. Here's uh, some of his commentary on that one. Shiva pervades everywhere without being different from anything. How can anything be other than Shiva? Consciousness, the supreme energy, spreads everywhere in the universe. She is matter and material objects and consciousness and conscious beings. She takes on attributes, yet she is without attributes. It is she who is sporting everywhere. How can there be anything different from her? In the universe that is only the play of consciousness, what could be impure or unclean? That which the ignorant see as the phenomenal universe is in reality the playful outer manifestation of consciousness. What can be done if a deluded person thinks that a rope is a snake? The snake and the fear and the trembling, the stuttering speech, the palpitation of the heart caused by the appearance of this are an illusion. The rope alone is the immutable truth. The imagined snake is the sport of the rope. Shiva is the isness of everything. Shiva is real. Shiva is all pervading. He never ceases to exist. He never vanishes. He is eternal whether he's perceived to be so or not. He is everything. He is in the fallen in the same measure as in the redeemed as much in the wicked as in the enlightened, as much in the sinner as in the saint, as much in an atom as the vastest cosmos, as much in a drop as in an ocean. He is beyond all limitation of space, time, or substance. He is everywhere. He is everlasting. He is in all, ever perfect. Indeed, to think that nothing is without Shiva is to see Shiva. So this was the this was the flavor that I was cultivating, you know, many many hours a day over over several months, and this 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 if you if any of those words landed in your heart, then you get a sense of the flavor. So um, often my boss would travel to Philadelphia of other places, and uh, once we were. Driving back from Philadelphia at one o'clock in the morning, he, he was in the back seat uh, with his wife. Um, rock music was blaring out of the radio. And I was immersed in this contemplation. This is all Shiva. I'm Shiva. He's Shiva. She's Shiva. It's all Shiva. And suddenly, Bang, it was like, it went from a thought, it went to an absolute obvious fact. Obvious fact. Stunning. And then right in that moment, the radio uh, played 
all you need is love. <laughs> and as the words of that struck me, it was like, oh, yes. I, I, and then the thought came up, ah, oh, wow, this is so wonderful. This must be where the great beings live all the time. This must be the path of the great beings. And right at that moment, a big semi-truck rolled up beside me, and on it in big letters was Path Mark. <laughs> and I thought, wow, I'd like to live here all the time. And as the truck rolled past, on the back was written, open 24 hours a day. <laughs> <laughs> so this is one of many, many, many um, kind of spontaneous revelations that happen in my life pretty much uh, you know on a frequent basis and Kimberly's life and the lives of many of the people that we work with that there's a, a sense of uh, what Joel I think often calls hidden hidden continuities that are actually there for us to discover any time then they're not hidden they, they are re they're revelations but they're here all the time. The, and, and then the attunement allows that to be discovered. So this is really kind of the essence of what has come to me through immersion in, in Kashmir Shaivism, um, discovery of this very playful relationship with consciousness that's playing in each of us and playing all around us. One of the great saints or the great uh, realized beings in this tradition, Laleshwari, a female siddha or realized being, this is one of her poems. Playfully, you hid from me. All day I looked, then I discovered I was you. And the celebration of that began. And the, the, this translation is actually by my, my guru, Muktananda. Um, he translated uh, um, a series of her poems. And he had great love for the tradition of Kashmir Shaivism. And through his encouragement, um, most of the major texts that had been published were uh, published originally through his encouragement of, of getting publishing houses in India to, to publish these translations. As he toured the world three times between 1970 and 1982, then he introduced many thousands of, of Westerners to this to this tradition. And I, um, during those years, was being trained to be a Swami. So um, I and I became a Swami in 1982. But the training for the become a Swami or a renunciate monk and and that tradition, uh, the the main training that he had us do was to memorize sutras from the Shiva Sutras, which is one of the main texts of, of Kashmir Shaivism, and all the, also the Pratnavichna Hridayam, or the Heart of Recognition Sutras. So that was, you know, that kind of contemplation uh, and deep immersion in this tradition was, was our preparation. So first I'm going to describe more broadly what Tantra traditions are, what Tantra is. And Tantra traditions uh, flourished all, all over the Eastern countries. And Kashmir Shaivism is actually just one variety of them. The word Tantra means, in essence, Tan, which means to spread, and Tra, to save. So Tantra is spreading or sharing that which saves us. Saves us from what? From from suffering, from the delusion of sense of separation. And from the point of view of any tantric perspective, every experience we have is a potential doorway. Because everything is consciousness, then any event, any experience, any sensory experience, any, anything that we can name is a potential doorway to discover this directly. So in the tantric tradition, everything, there's Everything is approached as an opportunity, as a doorway, a potential doorway for us to discover this over and over and over again so that we get clear. And this includes what 
religions may de either demean or, or prohibit. So, for example, sexual activity, um, you know, drinking wine, such things are actually, in a tantric perspective, wonderful opportunities, just as wonderful as any other opportunity, um, including opportunities that we might, might also might want to avoid, such as feeling sad or having, you know, some tragic loss or um, any anything that comes our way is equally a doorway. So if you could push the, uh, the slides. So the tantric uh, influence was very broad between about 600 to 1200 AD. And so spreading all the way from Afghanistan, what we see there now is Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, Nepal. You can't see um, uh, uh, Tibet because China won't let, I mean, I looked for a map in which I could show Tibet, but they've pretty much eliminated it from what you can find on Google. Um, but uh, that, you know, the, low, the left lower portion of what says China is actually Tibet. Bhutan, which is the only remaining kingdom that is still uh, tantric. Um, all of those countries, all the way through down to um, Bali in, in the Indonesia and all the way up to Japan and uh, most of China and Mongolia, which you see just above China, that pink, all of those were tantric kingdoms. They were over, they were smaller. So there were over 900 tantric kingdoms during that, that period. So there was a very powerful influence that the Tantra perspective had. Um, actually, the roots of Tantra go even further back into the ancient pre-Vedic culture of India, um, shamanic culture of India, so the roots of, of Tantra. And there are a lot of features that uh, date back from way back in those days, especially the worship of the female form as the, you know, the, the primary sort of orientation to this amazing universe that has been birthed. Um, so uh, next slide, please. So this is Paradevi, the supreme goddess, who is the most venerated image of, of the divine mother, the divine goddess in the Kashmir Shaivism tradition. And other forms are also deeply venerated. So the form of Kali, probably uh, many of you know about the form of Kali. So she is, She's another face of the same goddess from this perspective, uh, the fierce and frightening, frightening forms. In fact, all people and all life forms are regarded as her children. So this contrasts to uh, the dualistic perspective that most uh, religious traditions hold East and West, which emphasize somehow that the world is evil or needs to be overcome, that we can't reach God unless we overcome the world. Um, but Tantra actually says the opposite. No, it's right here all the time and everything. And for that reason, uh, Tantra was opposed by traditions that had existed before it became sort of uh, more influential, especially the, the Orthodox Vedic tradition in India, the, the Brahmins, uh, the priest, priestly caste uh, opposed uh, Tantric being introduced. And they were very challenged by the fact that in Tantra, women were fully included. And in fact, many of the gurus were female and the, the founder of the particular rec the recognition school was founded by a, a female Siddha or realized uh, guru. And also um, so-called outcast, that was completely disregarded. Uh, everybody was welcome. There was no, you, in fact, it was prohibited that you, people talk about caste in the meetings that were held because they didn't want to have that kind of um, in distinction even, even acknowledged. Um, and the teachers in this tradition uh, generally have always been householders rather than renunciates or swamis. Um, and I went, <laughs> I've had these two phases of my life where I became a swami for 12 years and then the completely different phase, which has been much more tantric since I met uh, Kimberly and we have, you know, become parents and, you know, living a life that is in no way sort of <laughs> isolated in any way at all. <clears throat> the uh, heart of recognition, the 
this particular text, which is very uh, dear to my heart, was uh, published uh, or you know written and and written down in the, at about a thousand, uh, the year a thousand in Kashmir, and the king of Kashmir was a patron patron of the recognition school. And so, uh, actually, um, if you go to the next slide, please, you may know that Kashmir is an immensely beautiful place surrounded by uh, snub cap um, Himalayan mountains and then these lakes. And Kashmir was a east-west cultural co uh, crossroad from uh, Greece through Persia, across India, through, through Tibet, China, Mongolia. So there was a constant flow. This was like the middle of the Silk Road, where there was a constant cultural interchange taking place. And consistent with the emphasis uh, in the tantric traditions on, on the relishing century experiences as actually divine experiences, then in tantric culture, uh, there was a lot of um, support for art form. So, and in, in especially there in Kashmir at that time, music and poetry and drama and painting and all of that was greatly um, uh, supported by by the king and 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 was a major part of the tantric uh, tradition is the the flourishing of the arts. Abhinava Gupta, who's considered the greatest exponent of the Kashmir Shaivism tradition is still uh, even today considered uh, India's greatest philosopher uh, of aesthetics. And he holds this, uh, uh, a role similar to Aristotle, in, uh, Aristotle in terms of what we understand of the Greek tradition. So a bit of a Gupta in terms of aesthetics had that sort of um, role of, of uh, describing how to engage in, in, in our uh, appreciation of, of life forms and, and art. This is one of the things he said. The ideal audience of a dramatic production appreciates the amazing skill of the playwright actors in the stage setting. And uh, he encouraged us to live as connoisseurs, connoisseurs of every single experience of life as an expression of the divine play. So not just while we attend, last night, Kimberly and I went, um, she, it was the only thing that she did yesterday. We had tickets to hair. Um, if you know that. And she was able to drag herself out of bed and, uh, and, and we went there. And it was a beautiful dramatic production. And yet the encouragement in this tradition is the place going on all the time, whether we're in a so-called drama or not, there's the drama of life. Now, Kashmir Shaivism co-emerged um, with Dzogchen in Odiyana. So if, uh, next slide, please. So you can see that Odiana, um, uh, let's see, if you look right in the middle, Janjma and Kashmir is uh, nowadays where, this is in uh, the northwestern part of India. <coughs> Left of that, you see Rapal Dindi, which is in, uh, currently in Pakistan. And the sort of northern part of Pakistan uh, used to be called Odiana. This was the origin of, of Zojin. So God of Dorji was the, the first teacher of, of uh, the Dzogchen tradition, and Padma Sambhava was his disciple who then brought it into Tibet. And so this, these, uh, you could say that um, Dzogchen and Kashmir Shaivism are cousins in that they arose together and they sh share very similar perspectives and practices. Um, so here's a uh, comparison of, of those perspectives. This is from Abhinava Gupta, that great teacher. And uh, go ahead and change the slide, please. So uh, gaze at that image there and listen to his words. Just as the images of various things such as cities reflected in a mirror are inseparable from it and yet appear distinct from each other and from the mirror, this world manifests without any separation from the flawless awareness of Supreme Shiva. And yeah, sure. Just as the images of various things such as cities reflected in a mirror are inseparable from the mirror and yet appear distinct from each other and from the mirror, this world manifests without any separation from the flawless, flawless awareness of Supreme Shiva. So Shiva would be you. 
This is from Garab Dorje, uh, the founder of, of the Dzogchen tradition. The ground of being is present in all appearances in the same way that a mirror is able to hold an image of the rising sun. I'll repeat that one again too. The ground of being is present in all appearances in the same way that a mirror is able to hold an image of the rising sun. And then, of course, one of the great Zen patriarchs said, there is no mirror. <laughs> because there's not two. The mirror and, in other words, any, any attempt to separate these is <clears throat> putting in a duality that isn't here. Now, this perspective contrasts strongly with Vedanta, which is, is that was then and then still the predominant philosophical and practice perspective in Indian philosophy. Vedanta means the, the latter portion of the Vedas, and it's principally composed of the Upanishads, which you may be familiar with, um, and some other texts, or you know, document this. And what a, one of the great recent exponents of uh, Vedanta philosophy was Sri Ramana Maharshi, who's you know was an amazing, uh, amazing teacher. However, the perspective of Kashmir Shaivism differs quite differently. Di or that's a uh, double, double saying it. But so Vedanta states that Brahman or absolute reality is pure consciousness transcending anything that can be known, completely static and peaceful, motionless, and that creation, therefore, is not real illusory like an, a mirage, like the water in a mirage. And some un inexplicable way happens, termed maya, by which this world appears to be something different from that. So they've, this second is brought in maya that's not Brahman, and somehow it makes Brahman appear to be the universe, which is not real. So that's the basic perspective. perspective. Kashmir Shaivism declares that the power to create is inherent in the nature of consciousness. And this is again from Abhinava Gupta. If the highest reality did not manifest in infinite variety, but remained cooped up within its concentrated singleness, it would neither be the highest power nor consciousness, but something like an inert jar. I'll say that one again too. If the highest reality did not manifest in infinite variety, but remain cooped up within its concentrated singleness, it would neither be the highest power nor consciousness, but something like an inert jar. So if you could um, change the slide. So here's another one of Laleshwari, the, the female teacher that I named earlier. One of the things she said, hidden within the highest principle is the world that consists of the seer and seen. So it's a single a single reality that includes both the seer and the seen, not, not two. And this single reality is described in two ways because there's no way that words can capture it. So uh, there is an attempt by naming it as Shiva Shakti, a, a single reality. And the Shiva aspect of it, which is, the word Shiva means underlying, so that which underlies all. It also means good. So this is the transcendental, changeless, grounded being. And so um, see if when we go through this, you can do your best to sense what this is pointing in, into your some own experience. This is not describing anything that is at all separate from you right now. This is, this is right now for all of us. 
So in your own experience, there is an aspect of you that has always been, you could call it presence, presence is never absent. Your own presence has never been absent. So that presence never being absent is always, it's, it's transcendent in that it's not affected or changed by anything that comes and goes. <clears throat> this is our grounded being. There, it is no thing, and yet it holds everything. So that's, that's the Shiva aspect of us. And simultaneously, we have the Shakti aspect of us. Shakti means both power and energy. So Shakti is imminent as the ever-changing, vibrant, creative power, the energy of consciousness that is blossoming forth in every moment as everything that appears within consciousness. So these, these are a single reality, not two, but we can only describe them or hope to describe them by pointing out these aspects. Shakti, a word that's often used in this tradition, and there's a whole uh, text called the Spanda Karikas, the sutras about Spanda. S Shakti arises as a, a Shakti, uh, Spanda means throb or vibration. So Shakti arises as an initial throb in the heart of Shiva, and then phew, that throb expands out as everything the creation of everything. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so this is an image that attempts to portray this, the single reality that, that is both male, female, or any other polarity that we might want to name. Both at once. Hopefully you can see that the left-hand side is uh, the male, portrayal of Shiva, and the right is the female Shakti. Next slide, please. These are the first two sutras of the 20 sutras of the Heart of Recognition. This has been translated um, by uh, another person who's in the same tradition that I'm in uh, as the Recognition Sutra. So I, and I think there was a retreat that was held a number of years ago by one of the teachers here that focused on on that um, that uh, text. But I call it... Is it possible to enlarge it slightly? No. Can you put that on the big screen? That's a great question. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, that may be possible, but... Not right at the moment, like live. I wouldn't want to mess with this and screw up the whole thing. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry that it's hard for you to read because um, I wanted I uh, I wanted that uh, to be in a written form because you know some of us learn better visually or some of us learn by having both the, wor the words being spoken and then the visual. So um, whichever way you can orient to it. And the pictures are pretty. <laughs> <laughs> this is being recorded, right? It is, so hopefully, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it can be edited and, uh, and, you know, good. So these are the first two sutras of the, the actual original title means heart of recognition. So I prefer to call it heart of recognition rather than, um, than recognition sutras. And also because the word heart in this tradition is a very important word. It It's often, uh, that's actually the, the often the name for this reality will simply be heart, and the the, the Sanskrit word is, is hridaya, and our English word heart comes from the the word hridaya. You might know that Sanskrit and uh, almost all the Indo-European languages, they all, they all have their same roots in these these words. So hridaya, our own heart. So this is not someone else's heart. This is our heart. So the first two su sutras. If these two sutras can be grokked, can be discovered as true, then there's pretty much everything else unfolds out of these two. 
Chitti Swatantra Vishwa Siddhi Hetu. Uh, the word Chitti is very often used in this tradition also to describe this reality. It's a female word for consciousness. It means consciousness, but it's it is a female gendered word. So the translation is she, consciousness, in absolute freedom, is the sole cause of the manifestation of everything. <clears throat> and we're talking about right now. Your own consciousness is the sole cause of everything that you are experiencing right now. That's what this is saying. There isn't anything else causing what's going on here. In the second sutra, Swechaya Swabito Vishwam Unilayati. Through her own will, consciousness unfolds the universe on the canvas that is herself. You could put in screen. The, the word that's translated as canvas is also often translated as screen. Through her own will, consciousness unfolds the universe on the screen that is herself. So the next image, uh, the next slide, please. So this is one of the metaphors that's used in this tradition. The female spider who out of her own being creates the web and then out of her own being brings forth the, the little <coughs> spiders, the ch her children are birthed into, so you see all those little spiders that she's birthed into that web. So this is a metaphor for this reality. And <clears throat> perhaps makes clear why in this tradition, it's, she's turned she, because she's the mother. <laughs> she's the mother of us all. We're all born out of a, a mother's body. In this tradition, the emphasis is uh, iti iti. Iti iti means this, this, this right here, any form. And this is contrasted in Vedanta, the, the words are neti neti, not this, not this. Because in Vedanta, they want to point us to discover the Shiva aspect that is transcendental and beyond experience. But this tradition says, right here, right now, this, 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 and this, and this, and this. So all the appearances in this tradition are described as condensations of this fundamental power or energy of, of consciousness. In the same way that what we call H2O goes from being a steam that pervades in every direction to water that is condensed into a fluid, and then further condensed into snowflakes, and each snowflake is uniquely expressive of that substance that it is. No two snowflakes are alike, and yet they are all <laughs> forms of her. So that's another metaphor that's very often used in this tradition, is that um, all of this is just more condensed forms of her. Uh, next slide, please. So she is the power that moves in the waves of the ocean. Every vibration that is, is her vibration. She is the motion of every single creature. She is the what whirls the winds of storms. She is that which burns as the heart of the sun. These are the ways that she is described. One of the uh, names that she's given in this tradition Ashvadude, she who rides endless sense oppression, sense impression simultaneously. So in, in this room that what about maybe 20 of us and uh, watching here uh, on, online or maybe, you know, um, maybe 100 more people because our Sangha is also watching. All of us have <laughs> an enormous amount of sense impressions going on right now. Right? 
and each of us have a different set of sense impressions, although there's some overlap, but actually each perspective, a different set of sense impressions. <laughs> and think of what a small fraction we are of the gazillions of creatures just on this planet. And think there are billions of planets like this. Now we know there are billions of habitable planets. And that's all going on simultaneously. That's how immense her power is that she is in immediately showing up as all of this at once. So if hopefully this can be recognized easily. And if so, then in this tradition, there, there is the suggestion and the recognition tradition of what's called the easy way, Sukhopaya which consists of three steps. See if you can follow these steps right now. These are from, this is from Abhinava Gupta. First of all, the first step, <coughs> nothing perceived is independent of perception itself. <clears throat> so ask yourself, is anything that you are perceiving right now, can it be separated out from perception? I mean, how, how, where, where would you, where would you put it? <laughs> <laughs> to separate it from perception. Perception, second step. Perception differs not from the perceiver. Where are you going to separate yourself as apart from perception itself or perception from you? Could you possibly be, you know, something other than perception? Is that some process that is somehow separate or different from what you are? Therefore, the universe is nothing other than and not different from you, the perceiver. That's the third step. Since everything perceived cannot be separated from perception, and perception cannot be separated from the perceiver, then it's all, it's all one. <laughs> That's the easy way. Um, I'm not going to take uh, questions uh, until the end. I just want to hear that last one again about the universe. Uh, therefore, the universe is nothing other than or different from the perceiver. You being the perceiver, right? Here's a long chimpa from the Dzogchen tradition's way of saying the same thing. There is no separation in awareness between perception of sensory appearances and the consciousness of them. Again, see if you can discover this right now for yourselves. There is no separation in awareness between perception of sensory appearances and the consciousness of them. How could you separate your consciousness of sense perception from, from, from where are you going to put them? <coughs> and this is also expressed in the Heart Sutra and the Mahayana Buddhist tradition as form is emptiness, emptiness is form. Now, it's not accessible for us always to be able to have clarity about this. And this is described in this tradition in terms of the three malas. So the three malas, mala means coverings. These are contracted energies that seem to fail us. How are we doing on time? Okay, good. So the three malas are described in terms of, first of all, can, can you see that? Looks like you can. I'll do my best to just name it. So anava mala is the basic sense of being an anu. Anu means point. One point, so, uh, you know, you can, and this tradition is fine to take notice of, of this basic sense that we often have, that I'm just this one point over here. I'm just this one point on this, there's this display, and I'm only this one point over here that usually seems to be just this body. This body, right, I'm just this this little part over here, and everything else is, I'm not that. So I'm just, <laughs> I'm shrunk down to this one little point. So that's the anabhapaya. I mean, excuse me, uh, the... the um, Anubamala, the basic sense of just being this 
separate unit that's limited and cut off from the universal flow of what's happening. Right? Okay, so can you identify or, you know, try and identify that there's a tendency to think that I'm just, just this one little part. The second covering is described as mayiyamala, the feeling of difference, of perceiving things as different from uh, oneself and from one another. So, you know, it's pretty easy to look around and say, oh, everything looks different from everything else, and that person looks different from me, and it's all different. That's the uh, Maya Mala. And Karma Mala is the sense of doership, <clears throat> of identifying ourselves as a, this personal self that's doing good things or bad things. The Karma Mala. To go about a life feeling constantly, uh, I'm the doer of everything that I do, and some of the things I do are good and some are bad. And that comes <laughs> along with a lot of other heavy baggage. <clears throat> so failing to recognize this is all, all is consciousness, then we find ourselves kind of covered up with these three contractions. So three ways of, um, you know, freeing ourselves from these three malas are offered then. The three upayas. Upaya means way or skillful means. And each one of them addresses one of those malas. So the anavopaya, which means kind of the personal way, is uh, the framework of, of that type of practice is I'm an individual seeking to eventually discover my true self through these practices. So we engage in practice from the perspective that I'm not really Shiva, but I'm, I believe I, I might be Shiva, and I want to discover I'm Shiva, so I'm going to do these practices. And this is the antidote to the karma mala, the sense of I'm, I'm the doer, and I'm, you know, I'm doing everything. Then there's Shaktupaya, or the Shakti way, or the empowered way, which is framed as, I am discovering this true self, this true nature, by directly engaging with the energies of the senses in the mind. So the practice is, uh, actually I should say a little bit about Anava. So Anava uh, Paya, the first one that I named, practices in that are often things like Hatha Yoga, or um, work the work that we do, or engaging with something that's tangible in some way, as the starting point just as the starting point, but we start with something that we can concretely identify. Um, in Shaktupaya, actually, we work with more subtle aspects of ourselves. So the way we perceive things, the kinds of thoughts that we have and the feelings that we have, we work with the, the, that more subtler aspect of ourselves in the Shaktupaya. So kind of like um, the description I gave of the contemplations I was having while I was uh, driving that car. So, you know, I was, my thoughts and my feelings were engaged with that contemplation, and that would be called sh Shaktupaya. And this is the antidote to the sense of difference, that everything is different from each, you know, from us and from everything else. And then the uh, third upaya, Shambhavopaya, Shambho is in, means the same thing as Shiva. So this is the way of true identity. And this perspective is, I am remaining immersed in directly experiencing this awakened self, riding the moment-to-moment -moment momentum of insights and revelations. This is when we don't need, you know, it's like, it's clear. And we just <coughs> hang out there as, until something else happens and maybe we get knocked back into some, something that's not so clear. But this is the antidote to the anavamala, to the sense of this primal contraction of being a separate uh, unit, a single unit. You might think of these as, uh, or I do, I think of these as kind of like learning to become a good surfer or a good snowboarder. I'm a snowboarder and I, I have surfed before, but I'm much better at, at snowboarding. So, you know, at the beginning, you find out, okay, snowboarding is a cool thing, and you need to get a snowboard, and you need to, you know, you know have the right boots, and you, and you need to, um, you know, learn how to strap on the boots, and you know, you, you have to get ready. Then, so then you need to learn to actually stand up and 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 not fall down, and that takes a while, 
that would be uh, so, so the first stage would be the anavopaya, you know, that you're working with the concrete elements of snowboarding. Then you're learning how to actually get up and stay up for a few moments, and then eventually you can just ride. Now, the riding, that's shambhavopaya, where, in fact, thinking gets in the way. You don't, you don't want to either push thoughts away or engage with thoughts, because those are, you need to stay attentive to the actual feeling of riding it. That's where your attention needs to be, and Thoughts can come and go, but you're not engaged with thoughts at all. You're engaged with the actual feeling of the writing and just writing and writing and writing. And eventually, as these practices proceed, and hopefully you can see for that, that these are, they appear to be sequential or hierarchical, but they're not. <coughs> because, I mean, nobody learns to surf or to snowboard unless they go through these stages. They're, 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 inter they're integral to one another. And they happen spontaneously. In other words, you don't have to kind of think about it. It's just the way it happens. Eventually, this leads to what's called anupaya, no way. No way, because there's nowhere to go and nowhere to get. And, it, it, you know, <laughs> that then there's, there's the malas are no longer present and nothing else is needed. So um, now we're going to be doing some, some more practices. Uh, we're going to do some what are called dharanas. So another one of the major, um, major practices in this tradition are from a text called the Vijnana Bhedava Tantra, which is a very ancient text that contains 112 dharanas, or brief meditative practices, uh, that include all kinds of things. And, one of these darn has had a big effect on our dear friend. So I'm going to read um, from, because, uh, yeah, you'll see. You probably already know this, but I think it's worth. So first of all, take this reading as a, as a meditation for yourself, please. Because when, <sighs> when someone is awake, has Joel, expresses himself. <laughs> that That is imbued with a power. Those words are imbued with a power to awaken us. So please take these words, you know, in that way right now. So this is when Joel was in Sheldon. Sometime in the middle of the night, I woke up feeling agitated and restless. For a while, I tossed and turned, trying to go back to sleep, but found it impossible. Finally, I gave up, switched on the light, and opened Zen Flesh, Zen Bones by Paul Reps, Skip, skipping over the first chapters, which contain Chinese and Japanese Zen stories. I turned to the last section titled Centering. According to the preface, this was a translation of an ancient Sanskrit manuscript detailing in 112 short verses Shiva's instructions to his consort, Devi, on various ways to attain enlightenment. <clears throat> I read through them quickly and found a lot of the mater material familiar from other sources. Most of the verses dealt with points of concentration, like the gap between <clears throat> the in and the out breaths. In the past, I had at least been able to grasp intellectually the purpose of these exercises, but, was, <clears throat> but what was peculiar about this reading of them was that I was no longer a able to make sense of them at all. It was like reading pure gi gibberish. Apparently, my cognitive powers had ceased functioning altogether. Disgusted, I put the book down, turned out the light, and tried to go back to sleep. As I lay in the darkness, however, verse number 50 crept back to mind. It read, at the point of sleep, when sleep has not yet come, an external wakefulness vanishes. At this point, being is revealed. These words were the last things I thought about as I approached that very point between waking and sleeping described by the verse. I had not planned it that way. It just happened, and suddenly, lo and behold, being was revealed. Several days later, I wrote a hurried account 
about what had happened next, it's perhaps, perhaps worth quoting here. I jump up, turn on the light and look around. Sure enough, I no longer see through a glass darkly. The veil has been lifted and the glass has been cleared. No more than cleared, it has vanished. I see the kingdom and now I am laughing wildly because the great joke of it all is that this exalted king kingdom I have been searching for in such anguish and despair is none other than this very room in which I have been sleeping with its dirty cinder block walls, frayed curtains, and horribly grungy blue-green rug. Oh, I could have kissed that rug and those walls. I could have shouted. I could have danced. I could have done anything for that matter because it really didn't matter. I didn't even exist and never had. I was free. Hmm. So, makes tears to my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, these darnas are powerful, <coughs> and we're going to do a few of them. So, first, I want to kind of just name a few of the darnas so you get some of the flavor of the ones that you won't be able to do here in this room. Many of them bring attention to very common experiences each of doorways. So here's one. The delight experience at the time of sexual union when one's energy is excited and absorption is completed is the very bliss of the absolute. That bliss is your own true nature. Meditate on that bliss. Or when one experiences the expanding joy of savoring the pleasure of eating or drinking one should sink into the perfect condition of this joy. Then there will be exquisite delight. Or, when the mind of a yogi is united with the unparalleled joy of song and other aesthetic delights, then the yogi's mind expands to the point of merging with that joy. So, I'm offering those as kind of other ways to pra <coughs> practice it. But we're going to do um, ones that we can do in this room. <laughs> <clears throat> so this first one, so I'm going to sing the Sanskrit just so you can hear it and then uh, give you the words and we'll, we, we each one of these will do a, like about a five minute practice, okay? This first one is actually probably better done with eyes closed. Urdve prano kyato jivo visar gadmat prachodayet. Utpati dvita yastane barara nadbari tastitihi. The universal creative energy ceaselessly expresses herself as the inward and outward flow of the breath. By settling into the two resting places where the inhalation pauses and where the exhalation pauses, experience a sense of fulfillment that is full to the brim. I'll read it again. The universal creative energy ceaselessly expresses herself as the inward and outward flow of the breath. By settling into the resting places, the two resting places, where the inhalation pauses, and where the exhalation pauses, experience a sense of fulfillment that is full to the brim. So without in any way trying to alter the rhythm of your breath, become attuned to the sensory feel of the breath as it flows the wave-like rhythm of the breath. Notice that the sensations of the inhalation are somewhat different than the sensations of the exhalation phase.
Now, with each inhalation, as it completes itself like a wave landing on the shore, notice that there's a very brief pause before the exhalation begins. And as the flow of the exhalation completes itself, again, there is a very brief pause. And then the movement of the inhalation begins. Become very interested in these pauses. So another practice, this one with eyes open. So let's see, here, please gaze at this, this beautiful work of art here, done by one of the CSS uh, members at, for this practice. So turn your gaze towards, towards this image here. Stula rupasya bhavasya sadam drishtam napachaja Achinena nidaradharam manakritva shivam brajet. By fixing one's gaze steadily on a beautiful physical form and becoming immersed in the direct experience of that form, rather than having thoughts about the form, in a short time one will experience the divine reality. by fixing one's gaze steadily on a beautiful physical form and becoming immersed in the direct experience of that form, rather than having thoughts about the form, in a short time, one will experience the divine reality.
So the next one is another um, eyes closed one. It doesn't have to be, but it's probably going to be, we're going to orient to sound. Pranava adita samchare putlet sunya bhavana sunya ya parayat shakya sunyata eti bhairavi. O goddess, by chanting the sacred syllable Aum and by meditating on the supreme energy of the void at the end of the recitation, the yogi merges with that void. O oh, goddess, by chanting the sacred syllable Om, and by meditating on the supreme energy of the void at the end of the recitation, the yogi merges with that void. So we're going to sing together Om for a little while. And I'll, I'll hit the bell once when we're going to win our last Om. And then see if you can stay with, like this suggests, just let that final ohm settle within you and see what is revealed by not doing anything about it, but letting it settle into you. Okay? So if you prefer to keep your eyes open, but I, I think it's easier to orient to the vibratory quality if your eyes are closed. Uh, <coughs> please with me. Ah. Uh... 
it said, um, I felt a moment of sadness when, when you were describing the difference, the supposed difference between the Vedanta view and the Sh Shvai, Kashmir Shvai. Kashmir Shvai view that, um, that this is the more direct, whole, unified, truly non dual view. And the other one presupposes a, a sort of a secondary force outside of the original, whatever, that then creates all this. And because it's this the secondary thing, it, it's somehow then different. But when I heard that, I'm like, it's, I, presumptively, that seemed ridiculous to me. I mean, we already <laughs> seem to have a model where, you know, there's the absolute and the, and the relative, you know, and there's a different levels, if you will, of manifestation. Well, why couldn't one of them, let's say the first one be, okay, there's that, and then there's the creation from that. And why would that have to be considered separate so much so that you create another school and have division in which should be like a non-dual, you know, spiritual world? I, I don't know, it just struck me as... Uh, can I jump in? Yeah, here yeah, for yeah. A please, oh, please do. Yeah. I think that uh, this is a very interesting uh, discussion and debate to get into, and I'm not trying to cut it off. And I'm not trying to make a debate. <laughs> well, yeah. the point is there, there is a debate between the Vedantas and the Tantra people, and it goes, it's been going on for centuries, and it's still <laughs> going on. There's a wonderful representative of the Vedanta, modern Vedanta society. Do you remember his name, Tom? Prabha? Sarva. Sar um... Sarva Pranav uh, yeah, Sananda. Yeah, he, he's brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. And he takes the other side. And then, you know, so they, it, so it's a continuing debate. But from a, from a practical point of view, I think one way to look at it is, first of all, to remember nobody can tell you what the ultimate reality is. So this debate at the high level of is it, is it just Brahman and everything else is Maya or is, or is this really real and somehow? We're, we're getting lost in concepts at this point, mm -hmm. and that's interesting and whatnot, but we have to remember that this is only concepts. And then the, the, then we turn the attention to, so what's the practical result in terms of what we can do? And, um, and by the way, I do want to say something that the danger of Tantra is this all this business of, oh, just go out and drink wine and have sex and all that. That can be really mistaken, badly, sadly so. <laughs> and so both, you know, both sides have their, like any else in life, you know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so if you if you're one-sided about it, you'll you'll fall into uh, a trap. So this uh, this is very interesting. You brought up I've never heard this before, but this because of the in the Sanskrit. Uh, Eti, eti, what is it? Iti, iti. Iti, iti. Just the other side of neti, neti. Yeah, that was very Yeah, neti, 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 neti. Not this, not this. What? It's just, it's the, it's the, you know, negative of iti. Of iti. Right. Iti mm -hmm. becomes neti when you say not this. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, neti, neti, not this, not that. And then iti, iti is this, this, this. Both can be extremely valuable practices, depending mm -hmm. on where you are on the path. Mm -hmm. And it's not like one or the other. So like uh, uh, David Cunningham out there, his practice was neti neti. Mm -hmm. Neti 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 until everything else, you know, this is not me, this is not me, this is not me. What's left? Boom. And then everything is that. Mm -hmm. Or you can try to get people to say, okay, look between your breaths right now. Look, look here, look there. You know, I quote... Uh, Rabbi Joseph Ben Sholem of Barcelona mm -hmm. all the time, mm -hmm. about every time the state of things is altered, right. God's were, nothingness is revealed. Yeah. That's, that's, a, that's, iti, that's iti. Iti, iti. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, we shouldn't get uh, trapped by these dogmatic, rigid dogmatic positions. We should say, okay, what's going to be useful here? Mm -hmm. And to whom? When? It's not just abstract. So if you come along and your thing is, I'm, I really... I, I feel I am this body and this stuff. I say, okay, well, look and see, really. The body, the sensations, they rise, they pass. Are you arising and passing? Not this, not that. Or you come along and, and you, you know, you say, I don't want to, I want to go off in the mountains. I want to be in a monastery. And so I say, why, why do that? It's right here. Look, <laughs> look right here. If it's, if you're not going to find something in the mountains you won't find right here. Although sometimes it is good to go in the mountains. I'm not knocking that either. But who's, you know, at what point on the path is somebody uh, that this teaching is going to be useful for? Anyway, I just wanted to 
<laughs> thread that needle between the debate between the two no, traditions. Really we don't have enough thumbs to put up here. <laughs> yeah, and then to add to that, so skillful means uh, would be that wherever the questioner is at, then the response would meet that person where they're <laughs> at, which might be they need to be pointed to neti neti at this particular stage, or maybe, you know, so in other words, none of none, none of the means are actually, uh, they're, they're skillful, either they're skillfully used or not, but the means themselves don't. <laughs> they're relative. Yeah, yeah, they're relative. Or they are skillful, but everything is stage specific, so it might be. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great, thank you, perfect. And the upayas are meant to be a um, an explicit bridge to the to mm -hmm. to the, the fact that we spontaneously move in stages. Mm -hmm. Like we, it's not like we reach a certain stage and we're permanently at that stage. You know, when we wake up the next morning, we're at a different stage. So the upayas, the the this you know these th the three upayas, offer a place that we can always practice from, no matter if my perspective is them. I'm just this person and I feel cut off. That's a good place to start practicing. <laughs> Wherever we're at is a right. good place to practice right. from. Great. Thank you both. Yeah. Did Meg's question Meg, come to Meg you? has a chat. Oh, okay, great. Let's do Meg's chat question. Meg says, given that there is no me, no them, no good, no bad, how do we work with what my little bit of consciousness sees as clear difference between what I perceive as the love and hate present in the world now? What beautiful question, Meg. Thank you for that. Um, so this is a very profound question um, because there is immense suffering um, all around us and uh, we don't want to in any way dismiss that or not recognize that or engage with that. Um, so, well, I, if we can come, if we can learn to come from the love and compassion that we feel for anyone, if, if, we, can, if we can feel loving compassion and come from the loving compassion for anyone who's suffering, then that the vibration of love and compassion is the most beautiful, powerful uh, vibration or, or energy that can emanate in this universe and that has, when it emanates, it emanates into everyone and everything. So it does contribute to a shift but that may not be obvious to us. And then on a personal level, um, if there's if if it's available to us to act skillfully to benefit someone who's suffering, then we feel hopefully we feel motivated and we act on that. Um, and so in, in my work, um, you know, my work involves being a, a psychologist working with people with chronic health conditions, chronic pain, cancer, um, Parkinson's, um, multiple uh, sclerosis. Uh, brain injuries, uh, all kinds of very troubling health conditions, and they suffer a lot from that. And um, if I can remain centered in and come from a sense of love and compassion, then I find that I can be skillful in helping them. And I don't absorb their their suffering. Uh, uh, my, you know, my love grows by by living from that love and giving that love in the way that uh, perhaps it can be received. And I'm just using myself as a real example because every person has a different set of circumstances in which they can serve. But ultimately, as an individual, we are here to serve. That's our, our ultimately the realization is that as an individual expression, my expression is to serve to serve in every, every, any and every way that I can and serving out of, out of compassion, uh, a, a feeling of love that emanates and, 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 and is expressed in our, in, our, in our life, in our actions, in our words, and in, in our thoughts. So there's no lack of opportunity, obviously, for us to 
grow that compassion and that expression of that compassion and that love in, in every way that we can. Um, uh, hopefully that's, there's another answer, but you know, I'll, I'll just mention it. Uh, this is one that Joel sometimes uses, you know, because we ask, well, why, why, why can't there just be a life that has no suffering that has, why can that be a life where there's no hate? And uh, as Joel has pointed out, if, uh, you know, so this is a, the play of consciousness and it includes everything that could possibly happen. Her creativity is, is not limited in any way by human conceptions. And uh, like Joel has said, um, if, uh, you know, the, the story of, um, of the pr Prince Charming and, and um, whichever of those stories, if, if it starts out with, they met and they lived happily ever after. If that was, if that was the whole story, if there wasn't some drama or some difficulty, some huge challenges that came and some suffering, then it wouldn't be a very, it would not be a full expression of, of what life can be. Um, so, this life is her play and it includes everything that's going on. And of course, our minds want it to be different, but. Nonetheless, it is what it, it is. What it is. It's, it's the full drama is here, I guess. It's something else to add to that. Do you want to say something Actually, about no, you, that? You were very eloquent about that. And I think that really at this point, the, what you said about compassion and, and uh, one of the things actually that, that uh, you can mistake about the, uh, the, the Shiva Shiva tantric tradition is this idea, I'm responsible for everything. I, but that's not I, the, the personal ego isn't responsible for everything. That's, that's uh, uh, Shiva's responsible for everything. And ultimately, yes, you are Shiva, but, but the personal ego is not Shiva. That's very important to understand. So when you're sitting here and, and you, I don't know, watching something on television, it's awful. We see the news today is, you know, it just tears you up. You have to think, okay, I am now, you take the relative point of view, I am this body-mind here, a limited body-mind, not ultimately, but in a relative sense, limited body-mind with limited powers. I'm not, I am not God. The ego isn't God. So what can I do to, to help? And, and it may not, maybe there's nothing you can do with what's going on, let's say, overseas, but you can be nice to the mailman who comes up to your house who's that he's grouchy today it's rainy and he's cold and, and you know you can give him a smile and, and this is the way we present we prevent ourselves from falling into this uh, hatred and uh, aggression and so forth so the littlest things we do is what is what keep us i mean for in terms of serving each other and in terms of expressing love and compassion the very little things is what what keeps us peaceful and happy with each other if we neglect doing those things and we start acting out of, uh, you know, vengeance and uh, <coughs> aggressive uh, hatred emotions and stuff, then we'll turn our little spot in, of the earth here into a into a Ukraine or into a Middle East or whatever. We're we're all we're all guilty of this, you know. It's not like it's the, those people over there and uh, you know they're barbaric or something. We've risen above it. In fact, just look around the news. What's going on in this country? And uh, you'll see how fragile uh, our peace, our our worldly happiness is, really. So uh, we do what we can do, and just in whatever increments we have, whatever little bit we can do, and not beat ourselves up because we can't do more. That's that's the way God designed it. You can do this, and you can't do more. Beautiful. Thanks for that. Bringing that clarity for us. No. Okay, we I think we need to bring uh, our meeting to a close. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for being present. Namaste. I bow to that presence in all of us. Thank you, Jim. I'm just one person. Thank you for coming down. Beautiful. Oh. Beautiful.